Retinal vascular disorders is going to be the topic of this lecture. And by retinal vascular disorders, I'm referring to the central retinal artery occlusion and the central retinal vein occlusion. So you have a central retinal artery. The retinal artery is, uh, is uh, the first artery off of the internal carotid artery in most people. And that's going to branch into uh, several branches, smaller branches, that then go off to different parts of the retina. Now, if the entire retinal artery is blocked before it gives off tributaries, uh, branches, then it's considered a central retinal artery occlusion. If it's just a branch that's blocked, that can cause symptoms, but that would be considered just a branch retinal artery occlusion. And it works the same way with the veins. If the main vein that's leaving the eye is blocked, then it's a central retinal vein occlusion. If it's just a tributary of that vein, then it's a branch retinal vein occlusion. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so the central retinal artery occlusion is an occlusion of the retinal artery, as mentioned. It's the first, uh, it's the first artery coming off of the internal carotid. And it presents as a sudden, profound monocular loss of vision without pain or redness. So this is just like having a stroke to the eye. And about 1 to 2% of patients will present with bilateral uh, CRAO, but that's pretty unusual. The incidence is 1 in 10,000, and the average age of onset is in the 60s. So this is a disease of the elderly. However, if you do see this in somebody who's in their 30s or 40s, uh, you should be highly suspicious of something like a thrombophilia. Uh, in many cases, the patient will have a history of giant cell arteritis, whether that's diagnosed or not diagnosed. That's also called temporal arteritis, and this is a big risk factor for central retinal artery occlusion. So that branch retinal artery occlusion, as was mentioned, uh, I'm not going to spend a whole uh, slide talking about it, uh, but this is just a similar process due to similar causes but it's a smaller clot and it affects a downstream vessel and so it doesn't affect as much of the retina as a central retinal artery occlusion. So this is, is much further downstream and so it affects a smaller part of the retina. And the symptoms will be similar but it will only affect the part of the visual field that that obstructive segment supplied. Okay, so what are the risk factors? Hypercholesterolemia, of course that's a risk factor for clotting. Obesity. Advanced age. Diabetes mellitus. And all of, the, all of these three things, hyper, well maybe not hypercholesterolemia, but obesity and advanced age, those are certainly, those certainly play into diabetes mellitus. But just having diabetes mellitus by itself, even if you're not obese and you're not advanced age, uh, that is a risk factor too. And then temporal arteritis is a big risk factor for uh, artery occlusion. And so what is temporal arteritis again? I addressed this in uh, a different lecture uh, in the medical section, but temporal arteritis happens in people 55 years of age or older. It involves a headache, scalp tenderness, and thickening or tenderness of the superficial temporal artery. And you should be able to feel a pulse over that artery. Uh, and it, it's right over the temple. If you feel your own uh, superficial temporal artery, if you feel your temple, you should be able to palpate that artery. Patients with uh, temporal arteritis, they usually have this, this inflamed, firm cord, and you can't feel the pulse because the artery is so inflamed. So what does this lead to, especially the hypercholesterolemia, the obesity, the diabetes, and the fact of being old? Those all can lead to or increase your risk of carotid artery stenosis and of atrial fibrillation because of small undetected heart attacks. And those things, uh, carotid artery stenosis because you're gathering plaque and atrial fibrillation because you can develop uh, a, a clot because of uh, a lack of uh, a lack of appropriate contraction. Both of those things, you can develop a clot or release a clot or release a plaque, and that can be the embolus that's needed uh, that can go into the uh, into the retinal artery. And so this is how central retinal artery occlusion. And if it's a smaller uh, plaque or a smaller clot, that's how a 
branch retinal artery occlusion can happen. Other risk factors include uh, congenital or acquired thrombophilia. You can acquire thrombophilia by taking birth control pills. And so those would be something you would look for in younger patients who don't have these uh, risk factors. And there's other risk factors in addition to these, but these are some of the most common that you'll see. So as mentioned, this is painless, sudden, uh, and often this is a profound loss of vision. 98 to 99% are monocular. The symptoms are sudden loss of vision. Acuity is typically worse than 2200, which is the cutoff point for being legally blind. And a lot of times they won't even be able to tell you uh, how many fingers you're putting up in front of their face, even if you get really close. Uh, there may be some preservation in the temporal field. Uh, I'm assuming that's because there may be some uh, additional, uh, there, there may be some additional circulation coming from somewhere else, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but the literature does say that there may be some preservation in temporal fields, and that is certainly the case. So some of the things you're going to want to know from the patient, or at least know on the question that's going to help you with the diagnosis, is how long have the symptoms been present. Usually when somebody loses their vision, they're going to get to the ER as quickly as possible. You also want to know if they have any past medical history of ocular problems. You'll want to know if the patient has a high cholesterol, if you ask the patient that or if you look at their charts. Do they have a history of diabetes? Certainly both of those would increase the risk of this being a central retinal artery occlusion. And do they have any history of stroke or TIA? That would lead you to believe that perhaps there's a carotid artery stenosis. And that's, uh, that's a big contributor to uh, retinal artery occlusion. Uh, now, I just want to, right now, uh, differentiate central retinal artery occlusion from something else, which is called amaurosis fugax. And with amaurosis fugax, you get a temporary loss of vision that usually lasts a few minutes, and then your vision comes back. With central retinal artery occlusion, you have a loss of vision, and it stays, at least until you get treated. On physical examination, you want to document their visual fields, and then get their visual acuity, even though it's probably going to be 2200 or worse, um, just to compare it to baseline and document it on the records. Uh, look for signs of temporal arteritis, especially in older patients, because that contributes, it strengthens your diagnosis. You should also check their pupils for uh, an afferent pupillary defect or the Marcus Gunn pupil. Oscillate for a carotid brewery, and then oscillate the heart for murmurs, uh, and especially an irregular beat, which can be consistent with atrial fibrillation. For diagnosis, uh, you'll want to get routine labs, uh, and that's great, but all patients with acute loss of vision should be referred to ophthalmology for a formal ophthalmoscopy, highlighting the fact here that CRAO, as in a lot of cases of vision loss, cannot be diagnosed with a simple handheld ophthalmoscope. You'll need to do a dilated, uh, dilated exam and have the uh, optometrist use their equipment. So findings consistent on indirect ophthalmoscopy, consistent with CRAO, includes retinal pallor, which makes sense because it's not getting enough blood, a prominent cherry red macula, and that is actually because the fovea, the, the macula, gets its vascularization elsewhere uh, from the chorio capillaris. And then attenuated arteries may be present as well as a boxcar appearance of veins. But what you're really going to notice is the, uh, the retinal pallor and the prominent cherry red macula. So here's a normal posterior pole. Here's your optic disc. Uh, and in the center here is your macula. Now the macula is red, but it, it's a lot different in comparison than when we see the uh, when we see the retinal artery occlusion. So here's an example of a central retinal artery occlusion, and as you can see, there's pallor here. This is much more pale. Now every, every ophthalmoscope uses slightly different lighting, uh, but you can see that there's a there's a uh, much more contrast between the macula 
and the rest of the retina, whereas here, the macula and the retina weren't as contrasted. You also see that you don't have a whole lot of vasculature around the macula, whereas on a normal uh, visualization, you do have vasculature around the macula. So here's another one. Again, the macula is much more prominent, that cherry red macula. See the same here too. So this is a branch retinal artery occlusion. So you can see that it's normal on the top here, but it's abnormal on the bottom. If the, if the rest of the retina was like this on the bottom, then you'd have a central retinal artery occlusion. You could, you'd be able to see this macula uh, very distinguished from the rest of the retina, but it's only distinguished from this retina here on the bottom, which is the diseased retina that's not getting enough blood. And then here's another one here, above the, above the macula. So the treatment, the patient is going to need admission through ophthalmology. The treatment is going to be under the guidance of an ophthalmologist, so I don't expect ever you'll be required to know how to do this or exactly how to treat them uh, in the ER or as an internist or even as a surgeon. Uh, but uh, you do need to know uh, that they need to be admitted, and it's worth knowing some of the things that... Uh, that ophthalmologists use. So presently there's controversy in the exact management for patients with CRAO, but most ophthalmologists agree with some basic principles. So high concentration inhaled 100% oxygen, that's something you can start in the ER, so that's something you should know. IV acetazolamide, IV corticosteroids, uh, those are done, uh, the IV uh, corticosteroids are done to reduce the inflammation, and that is expected to uh, help with, uh, with maintaining vision, reducing the inflammation. And then treatment of the underlying cause. As the internist, this is going to be your concern, finding and treating the underlying cause. All right. Uh, some ophthalmologists use intra-arterial thrombolytics, and they inject those thrombolytics into the retinal artery system. Uh, that's not uh, universal, but this has been uh, shown to be effective by the EAGLE study. So you can look, look up more on that if you want. But high, uh, high concentration inhaled oxygen, acetazolamide, corticosteroids, and treatment of the underlying cause. Uh, so upon diagnosis, it's going to be your responsibility to work the patient up for underlying causes. Uh, these don't just happen on their own. So the patient will have something wrong with them that put them at predisposition. All patients, regardless of their age, should get a carotid artery duplex ultrasound. Uh, they should get an echocardiogram to look for uh, atrial fibrillation or any other kind of abnormality, uh, valvular abnormalities that can gather clots and then, uh, and then release them. They should get an EKG, routine labs, that's usually done anyway, uh, when you're first uh, investigating a patient. An ESR is useful, uh, and that's kind of to look more towards the temporal arteritis that would be elevated. A fasting blood glucose is useful uh, to work them up for diabetes if they haven't been diagnosed with diabetes, and then coagulation studies. Younger patients or older patients who have normal uh, results after this workup uh, should get a workup for any kind of congenital or acquired thrombophilia. So factor V Leiden, uh, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, and so forth. Oh, and then elevated homocysteine. That was another one I wanted to add to. And that's another congenital thing. Older patients should follow up regularly. Patients with CRAO have a 56% mortality rate within nine years, and that's compared to 97, or sorry, to 27% in aged match patients who have never had CRAO. So that's that's a big deal when you think about it. Somebody who's older and has uh, the same, let's say you got two twins, and one twin develops a CRAO and the other twin doesn't, 
that twin that developed the CRAO is two times more likely to die within the next nine years. Uh, and that shows that uh, it's likely due to the fact that there's some level of, of, uh, of uh, increased thrombosis. Uh, the plaque is not stabilized. Uh, but it's important to remember that patients who have CRAO, really what this was was a stroke that just happened to go the right way. Rather than uh, go up to the brain, it went to the retinal artery. And so rather than having a debilitating or deadly stroke, you just got your eye taken out. And um, I mean, that's neither of those are good, but uh, this is the same pathologic process that causes a stroke. So um, it's important that patients are aware that they are at imminent risk of stroke and that you take interventions as necessary as if the patient had had a stroke. Okay, so central retinal vein occlusion is occlusion of the retinal vein, and this presents a little bit differently. So initially the patient will present with sudden monocular loss of vision without pain or redness, uh, but it's usually not as severe as the central retinal artery occlusion, uh, but this is a more progressive disease and the vision will worsen with time. And eventually pain, erythema, and watering can develop. So this is less severe usually when it presents, but with time, as when it's diagnosed with time, if it's not treated, it gets worse. Uh, the symptoms have a tendency to be noticed on wakening. I'm not sure why. The lifetime incidence is 2 to 5 per 1,000, and 90% of cases are seen over the age of 50. So again, this has uh, a preponderance in the elderly, and there's a slight male preponderance. Uh, the equivalent branch retinal vein occlusion is a similar process, but it affects a downstream vein, and so it does not affect as much of the retina. And the ophthalmoscopic findings will be localized. Uh, so when we look at what the ophthalmoscopic findings of central retinal vein occlusion are, you're only going to find them in one part of the, the retina with the BRVOs. Uh, BRVOs are thought to be most commonly caused by a mechanical compression on the branch vein by an artery, but there are other possible causes. Systemic hypertension is uh, considered the most significant major risk factor in BRVOs. So back on the CRVOs, they're very uh, similar as far as risk factors go, but other risk factors with CRVO can include primary glaucoma, uh, probably because of the elevated pressure, alcohol consumption, head trauma, and excessive physical activity. Symptoms include, as mentioned, progressive visual impairment. The natural prog uh, progression includes worsening of vision uh, to the point of blindness, pain, photophobia, redness, and eye watering. All suspected cases of loss of vision, as mentioned, should be referred to an ophthalmologist for formal indirect ophthalmoscopy. And the findings on ophthalmoscopy depend on how progressed the CRVO is. So typically with CRVO, we see a certain degree of optic disc swelling. There's going to be a certain amount of hemorrhages, and you may see some tortuous veins. But as it progresses, you're going to see uh, a more swelled optic disc, you're going to see more and more and larger hemorrhages, and a lot of times the hemorrhages get in the way to where you can't see the veins, uh, if, even if they are tortuous. So I'll show you some examples. Further tests to evaluate the CRVO include fluorescein angiography. Uh, when to do this test is at the discretion of the ophthalmologist. So here is a case of what would be considered early CRVO. Um, so the, uh, you, you can see there's some hemorrhaging here on these early veins. Uh, and then you uh, also have this tortuosity. This would be probably a little bit later. So you've got more hemorrhages here. And this is much later, too, because the hemorrhages are much further out. 
Okay, so this is a branch retinal vein occlusion. So you can see here that the veins and arteries are normal, but here you have this localized area of, uh, of hemorrhage. So this was found to be a branch retinal vein occlusion. Here's another one. Now just looking at the results of an ophthalmoscope, it isn't gonna tell you what the disease is. You always have to include it in the clinical picture of the patient. Any radiologist would tell you that. But with a patient with consistent symptoms, this is certainly a branch retinal vein occlusion, as is this. So patients with central retinal vein occlusions should be worked up for diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Uh, so both of those are easy. You can get them in the morning get a uh, fasting blood glucose level, get a lipid panel. They should also be worked up for thrombophilia markers such as factor V Leiden, protein C, etc. and then be worked up for an elevated homocysteine. For treatment, unfortunately, there is no available effective medical treatment for CRVO. Uh, various treatment modalities are under investigation, however, and they may be performed by the ophthalmologist. Some patients can get enrolled in studies, but you won't be responsible for knowing any of this on the USMLE. But some of those modalities include intravitreal administration of anti-VEGF inhibitors, so remember that VGF is a protein that stimulates angiogenesis, and so this will reduce the uh, development of more arteries, which is the classic response uh, when there's uh, ischemia. There's also intravitreal administration of corticosteroids to reduce some of the inflammation that invariably happens with this. Uh, the use of locally injected TPA and then plasmapheresis. Uh, complications include neovascular glaucoma, uh, panretinal photocoagulation can be performed either prophylactically in CRVO or as soon as there's signs of neovascularization, and macular edema is another complication for that. L laser photocoagulation can be effective, but only if it's due from BRVO. It has not been shown to be effective in CRVO. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave a message below.